All right. Hello, everyone. Um, looks like as soon as I said no, no quizzes every single week. Uh, oh, there goes half the class. <laughs> uh, maybe I should revise that. Um, so uh, we are live now. So assuming if anybody's watching this online, they'll show up in a moment as well. Um, I have. I wanted to talk with you about a few logistics in part because I now do have access to Moodle, so that's uh, that's a good benefit. Um, I realized after Tuesday uh, I had presented the wrong syllabus. I had had a different syllabus. VJ had emailed me and I popped it in the wrong folder. And so um, what I talked about in terms of the remainder of the course was not very helpful because it was a different class that, and a different semester that he was talking, he had that scheduled for. So I'm going to talk about that. I had a couple questions, emails uh, from some of you about what we're going to do about the remaining quiz grades, the office hour grades, all of that. Um, there is, uh, in the grade book that I see, you can basically see kind of what I see here. We, you had quizzes up to 11-11, um, um, and then I didn't see an entry for 11, uh, the next course time period. Actually, that was a Tuesday, right? So Tuesday and today, there was obviously no entries because you hadn't got there yet. Um, I don't feel like I can do justice for you to prepare quizzes and grade quizzes, and do all that, get you adapted to whatever system I might have, and manage my other classes. So my instinct right now is to, um, to kind of take care of that with the office hours in, in a sort of a combined way that's going to make sure that you're not penalized for the, the whole switcheroo that just happened. Um, and if anything, err on the side of being generous towards you. So I, I'm still thinking about what specifically I'm going to do, but I think I will um, essentially give you full credit for maybe three out of the, the five remaining courses after the switch, uh, classes after the switch, and just not have any grades for those last ones. Now, of course, you might be thinking to yourself, oh no, that's you know the daily quizzes, they add to 100 if you add them all together. I would just normalize so that, it, you know, if I cut off the last two, that's 92 out of 100. 92 then is a 100, right? So I would do that math to make sure that's in Excel properly. Uh, it does mean that the quizzes you have done have a slight more impact than otherwise, but again, that would be one reason I would give you full credit for a few of them just to get that out of the way. So I think that's what I will do with the remaining quizzes uh, in case there were some of you that were really uh, counting on a few more opportunities. Um, regarding the, the homework, I, likewise, there's some amount of points that are remaining to be assigned as homework. Um, my plan is to give you one homework assignment. I'll give it to you early next week, so you'll have it over the, uh, over the break. Try to have covered most of the content for it uh, before the break, and that'll also be posted on Moodle, uh, the uh, recorded lecture and slides. Um, that way we can go over that on the Thursday before the final as part of kind of an exam review. Uh, with that, of course, you know, if he had planned to do two homeworks, I'm going to weight it in such a way that it's going to account for the remaining weight of homeworks that was needed. Okay? So that should satisfy the remaining homework. It looks like you had three assignments so far and would have one more uh, last one uh, from my perspective of the gradebook. Um, regarding the final, I, I took another look at that as well, and I noticed that um, it, I think what he has done was left me with a final filled in with questions that he has covered for you so far and left a few blanks for me to add in for my content. Um, and I don't, I don't know, some of you are nodding. That sounds like maybe something what he said he would do. Okay, so I, I kind of misinterpreted that, um, what had happened. That makes sense to me. I'm happy to work with that. So that is what I'm going to do. But that also means I need to kind of check in with you about where we are, probably have a more of a normal lecture on Tuesday to make sure we cover enough material for the homework and the exam that way. Um, again, it'll be posted live in case you do have travel uh, arrangements already, so that shouldn't interrupt you too bad. OK, so that means I want to talk for a moment about the correct syllabus. Um, you guys are apparently not studying your syllabi enough because you didn't correct me last time. OK, so this is the one that actually was for your class, right? So we are here at 
the 18th, obviously. Um, and so attached growth is the topic that he had planned to cover. Um, and that's chapter 24 of your textbook. I'm not, I have to go back and look at the textbook. I think I have a, the textbook he was using, but I have not built my course materials around that particular one. So I apologize, but some of my slides will have examples from other textbooks and stuff. So anyway, and I do that for my own class. It's whatever textbook makes sense. <laughs> but um, I was not planning to cover attached growth per se. That would be a, having bacteria growing on some sort of media where you, you have that attachment and then that's a substance that's providing surface area for your biological growth to happen rather than having stuff free floating. Um, normally I spend a fair amount of time with secondary, with suspended growth and kind of build that up, model that. So that's what I was going to do today. Um, however, I, I have a question for you. <clears throat> have you covered biological oxygen demand at all yet? Yeah? Okay. And that was that kind of in the early parts of this? Okay. I, did you do that to the extent where you can model what happens downstream? No? Okay. So just kind of measurement of BOD and what it is, obviously. And, okay. So my plan then is to check with you today on how far you went with the suspended growth to see if you went to the extent that I, I have a prepared lecture for. Um, and then we'll probably on Tuesday go into BOD modeling in terms of what happens downstream uh, in a river if we do discharge waste and how far away is our oxygen sag going to happen. Um, so the, what happens in the river in terms of the oxygen. Um, and that would be kind of the wrap up point. So then the questions I would add to your exam would be based on kind of the, the wastewater microbiology concepts going into sort of modeling what happens in a waste activated sludge system, a suspended growth system, BOD um, questions kind of maybe extending on the types of things you've already learned to go into what happens downstream. So that's basically the two concepts that I'll be kind of adding here. <coughs> and my, my homework, I'll try to touch on the things that I see that he's covered based on looking at the exam, but it may not reflect that as well as his, his lecture material because you know, I'm not, I don't have a homework, homework uh, items from him. Okay, does that sound reasonable? Any concerns? Yeah. Yeah, that should not change because that's the university just says, okay, any class that meets at this time, at this place, you're going to have your exam at that time. Yeah. So what you're going to do about the bonus? So the, okay, so the bonus, there's, there's two bonus things, um, and I did not clarify exactly. So there's potential bonus for coming to office hours, right? Um, and by the way, I, I do have some time set aside right before this class as my office hours for my other courses. Um, you're welcome to swing by there, but otherwise it's kind of by appointment or maybe if we need more exam review time or something, I'll try to have a session set aside, um, maybe virtually if we, if we need or whatever. Um, there's not much time left in the semester. So um, anyway, the... Uh, I don't feel like I can do a good job getting all of you into my office <laughs> this, this for the rain of the week or you know, during Thanksgiving or the you know kind of study week after that. So I think I'm not going to do anything about counting you present there. I might just give everybody some flat credit for maybe as if you visited once before the final exam. Um, uh, perhaps what I'll do is I'll take some sort of attendance uh, in during the exam review time and count that towards it. Um, we can do like a, I use Kahoot, just, just log into a little phone app or you know, website and you know, answer a couple questions or whatever. So maybe I'll do that. And so your presence in the exam review, a little bit thinking out loud, I think that's a good idea um, to give you, so it looked like each time you visit office hours, that'd be two credit, there's two points towards the bonus. So I may do that um, in that regard. Uh, otherwise, for the, for the course feedback, I, I want to give you an opportunity there or not take away an opportunity that's in your syllabus, obviously. But the, to be quite honest, the feedback is not coming directly to me and BJ's not here anymore. So the, the feedback itself, 
Um, we'd like for you to give the feedback and the, we'll take a look at that as a department based on what happened. So you could, you could give good feedback to us like, hey, you handled this well, hey, you did not handle this well, whatever you wanna say. Um, BJ was great, Dr. Snow is such a bore. Whatever you, is your opinion, right? Uh, you, could, you could do that and we'll look at it and read it, uh, but it's not going to count against my ratings this time, for example. So you're not punishing or rewarding me for a good job. Exactly. You'll give us good feedback when we want it. All that said, I, I don't think I have a way to correlate it unless I look at each one of your um, feedback. So what I'll probably do is either get a little bit of feedback from you as a Kahoot or just give you automatic some points, okay? Um, so I'm not gonna take that opportunity away from you. I just have to figure out exactly what, what makes the most sense to me to, to give that to you. Um, and whether or not that requires anything from you, I'll communicate. Good news is I am in Moodle now. I've posted um, our lecture slides from last time. Tomorrow, I'll probably go through and upload all the videos so you, you'll have the video from um, this time and last time. All right, any other questions, concerns? All right, so um, well, my plan is to talk about secondary treatment. I'm probably gonna go pretty fast through this until you guys say, oh, I have not done anything that looks like that, okay? So we'll start with kind of basics. I think you've already done this. A typical secondary treatment system, we would consider having a, an aeration basin and a clarifier. So we'd have, before that, we'd probably also have a clarifier and that would be part of the primary treatment. And then we make a, a distinction here. The effluent from the primary treatment is the secondary influent. So if you see a problem that ever says primary effluent, that's meaning it's discharged from the primary set and going into the secondary, right? So that, then this would also be secondary influent. So then we have a controlled volume uh, drawn around a few things. We've got the aeration tank, a second clarifier, and a recycle line. You guys have seen, seen this with the suspended growth? No? Yes? Yes, no? Something like it? Just the, uh, as the system, the secondary treatment being shown, or suspended growth being shown as aeration happening in a tank, and then a clarifier. Okay, so it sounds like no, no problem. Um, you probably got a different uh, style or context of this. So I'll just go into it and just feel free to raise your hand if you're like, oh, we talked for an hour about that already, right? So just let me know, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start here like I thought. Okay, so the aeration tank, this is going to be suspended particles of bacteria, suspended junk in the water. This is going to be bubbling as much oxygen as we can. Sometimes we'll even use more expensive, so it's not common, but you can bubble pure oxygen. That'll give quite a high dissolved oxygen content in the water. Um, typically, you'll just blow air. So the, that air, the air blowers are gonna be one expense, just uh, the power and maintenance required for that. But otherwise, you're just giving plenty of oxygen so that the microbes can degrade all the oxygen demanding substance in there. You demand the oxygen before it's discharged out into the, the river or wherever. So we have this aeration tank. That's really where the bulk of the process is happening. We've got some volume, some concentration of the bacteria X, and some amount of substrate S. Uh, so X is the microbe uh, mass concentration. We'll go through this actually a little more elaborate in a minute. S is the food, the substrate. So when we grow all those bacteria, we let that process happen. The next step is to catch those bacteria again because we don't want all those discharged out into the environment and whatever other solids are accumulating. So in our secondary clarifier, we let everything accumulate down here. And then we kind of assume that the X in the effluent here is zero because we've caught all the solids, all the particulates that have come out. It's not true that there's no bacteria in there, but the way we weigh it, the way we measure it with the mass, it's almost true. It's a, a decent um, a decent assumption we can make if things are working well. And so we, for an ideal system, we'll assume that's true. That means all of the bacteria then are heading um, back through this RAS line, 
Rast line, this is a recycled activated sludge. That's gonna feed microbes back into, our, into the front of our treatment so that we know that we have plenty of microbes in our treatment. Um, if we were not to do that, then we'd have a, some problem if we get our flow rate too high or our residence time too low, we're flushing out all the bacteria and we don't have very many in there uh, consuming stuff. So that recycle line is very important to keep a good initial starting point of bacteria and to keep the same type of bacteria. You can go the wrong type of bacteria and then they start creating like foamy uh, byproducts and then you just have a lot of sludge escaping out of your clarifier, which becomes a big problem, especially because we control most of this with how much we waste out the wax line, the waste activated sludge. So out the clarifier, we take some of it to recycle and then we take the rest of it and we take it uh, and squeeze the, the water out of it, we uh, dewater it, and then we landfill it or send it to processing for biosolids. Okay, so that's, th you will find when we revisit this concept, or we'll talk about it more next time, that that's actually a really key to controlling activated sludge systems is how much you are recycling versus sending to waste. Okay, so uh, a few terms here. I keep saying WAS, uh, this is waste activated sludge. So we say activated because we're activating it with oxygen. It's obviously waste. Um, and this is kind of a slurry of microbes and, and other junk in it, right? The mixing essentially is provided by a lot, all that aeration. So we're adding so many bubbles that it can't help but to be mixed. Um, we've got another term you might encounter is wastewater strength. Oh, that wastewater is really strong or it's a weak wastewater. What people are referring to if they ever say that is simply how much BOD, how much substrate is in there, okay? So this is gonna be often between about 60 and 500 milligrams BOD per liter. And if you pause a moment to think about that and you think about the uh, dissolved oxygen, and we'll come back to this um, probably next week, dissolved oxygen at saturation can only really reach something like 8 to 10 milligrams per liter of oxygen. So that means if you have water with 60 milligrams per liter of oxygen demand per liter, then you're going to desaturate that water completely. And you're gonna do that, Let, let's say you do that, and then unseal it, let it get saturated from the air again, seal it again, you're gonna do that like 10 times before you get all of the oxygen demanding stuff out, right? So that's, if you were just to take that wastewater and go let it sit in a stagnant pool, it's gonna go anoxic quick. And that's gonna start smelling really bad because you get the uh, anaerobic process happening that forms methane, hydrogen sulfide, stinky stuff, uh, different, chemical, biochemical processes, um, the type of smells and, and all that that you associate with really uh, foul stuff, rotting things, anoxic processes, anaerobic processes. So just to put that in context, wastewater at minimum has a lot more oxygen demand in it than you would expect that what the dissolved oxygen content of water can suffice. Later we'll talk about, okay, how quickly is water being re-aerated when in contact with the atmosphere and all that. All right, another term, volatile suspended solids, VSS. Um, having a hard time remembering which class I talked <laughs> to about this already, um, but it's an estimate of the microbial concentration. It's a mass estimate. You can't really weigh a bacteria and then say, well, we have a million of them, so this is like half a gram. That's not gonna work. Um, but what you could do is make an assumption that most of the solid stuff that you can collect maybe with a filter or can dry out, um, you know, like collect and evaporate the water, what's left is sort of microbial or stuff that microbes have been eating and are associating with and are living on and all that. So for a crude method, what you can do is you can take that amount of stuff, whatever solids are there when you dry out a sample of water or filter it, um, you weigh your filter or your crucible. Before you do anything, you add the water, you get your solids, 
evaporate the water, drive off all the water, and then you weigh it again. You get some total solids. So that'll be a, a total solids um, amount. Then you take that and you burn it. You put it in a furnace at 500 Celsius, it's like eight or 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That'll burn off anything that can burn, anything that can oxidize. So all the organic materials are going to convert into CO2, uh, nitrogen, gas, N2, um, maybe nitro nitrous oxides, whatever. And you'll be left with whatever cannot oxidize and it's just left as an ash. It's, it would be um, kind of mineralized in that sense. So you would take the total suspended solids and subtract from that the amount of ash and stuff that's how much that weighs after you burn it all away. So you take the mass, say mass of the total suspended solids minus the mass of the residue. And that gives you <clears throat> what we call the volatile suspended solids. So when we say volatile, it's just all the stuff that will volatilize away. And we use that as a crude metric of how much bacteria we have, okay? And that gives us a way to check and measure within a couple hours how much bacterial related mass is in our system, which is pretty handy when we need to know that in order to know something about how quickly we're consuming the, the waste. Okay, um, one other topic here relating to VOD and growth of microbes is really the, the ratio of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So a typical secondary treatment process will remove somewhere around 90, 95, maybe 98% of VOD. So it does a pretty good job removing VOD. And really this is talking about um, essentially carbon. This is sort of the carbon component of oxygen demand. Uh, you could call it carbonaceous VOD. Technically there's also nitrogenous VOD but generally when we're talking in terms of like wastewater treatment for municipal plants, that's mostly carbon. I think last time I told you about the tissue recycling plants and kind of talked a lot about a, a bit of this already. Um, there's a ratio pretty commonly used in oceanography, the Redfield ratio, tracking algae, what might limit algae from growing, all of that. All right, I have a, a quick video. Actually, I need to uh, exit this for just a moment. A quick video just to kind of demonstrate a couple of these processes in action. Pull it up. whatsoever to not want to fall in there, you really don't want to fall in there because you'll have no buoyancy. All those bubbles, you will not float. You will not be able to swim. You will be sinking rapidly to the bottom of this like 18-foot uh, basin. And then you have to find the ladder and climb out because that's, that is the protocol. There are ladders in place, so spots. You don't want to fall into a wastewater basin. <laughs> Didn't have to tell you that. Just in case you uh, 
needed any more advice than that. Uh, and you'll probably hear that if you, do, if you ever tour, tour one of these. It's actually the reason you want to um, get far away from a sinking ship. If you ever are on a ship that's sinking, you want to get away from it because all the bubbles from just all the stuff going under um, could potentially sink you. Anyway, so that's the activated sludge. Now, you, now all of you are like, yeah, I'm totally never going to do environmental engineering. This is nasty. Um, just nightmare, right? Uh, okay, so that goes on, and then I think we're probably using this final basin here as the, the second uh, clarifier. Uh, looks like they've got a lot of scum forming on the top, so I don't think they're collecting directly from the top on this one. Uh, I suspect this is the that secondary sedimentation, and then they have possibly a disinfection contact with the chambers here, or this may be at the tail end of the uh, And then in a few moments, we'll kind of go around, you can see the, uh, the quality of the water coming out. It certainly appears to improve. It kind of looks like it might be a slightly murky river or something. I certainly don't want to be uh, drinking that directly, obviously. So this is kind of the scope, um, just a, a simple video, the scope of what, what we'd be talking about for kind of see the primary into the secondary and right here we're at the post secondary so we probably probably did a UV disinfection or something and then I, I would guess that this is they're collecting that for discharge. Um, I could be wrong maybe to have another treatment spot that they're not showing the video and they would go on to tertiary treatment. back up. Okay, so let's talk about the growth kinetics. Um, have you guys seen this equation before? The Monod equation? Okay, great. So that that's, uh, that's good. Um, so that way I can cover it, we can talk about it. Um, I think that'll work well. Okay, so mu here is going to be uh, our, if we, if we take a look, I have all, all these terminology terms written out. This is the specific growth rate coefficient for time. Um, and by the way, I, I apologize. In the future, I'll try to post these online for you to Moodle. So if you are taking notes and you want to do that on a tablet or whatever, you'll have it. I'm also going to post the annotated slides um, uh, tomorrow, if not later today. Um, okay, so. This Monod equation is really talking about how to describe the growth of bacteria in our uh, activated sludge system. So if we say R of G is the rate at which we have bacteria growing, then we can say another way to write that is dx dt, because x is our micro concentration, it's a mass concentration. And we can say this is going to be equal to mu x. So it's a first order rate equation. We, we know it depends um, on x to the power of one. So that's what's telling us it's a first order. We can also take a look at the units of mu, which is effectively our rate constant. You've probably seen a lot of um, you know, dn, dt for maybe disinfection is minus kt. Uh, for disinfection, you have the concentration of the disinfectant in there too. But Something like that, you've probably seen this repeatedly, I, I would imagine, in the class where you have some rate constant and time as a factor, right? No? Yes? Okay, so this, I mean, you probably saw mass balances that incorporated these. Um, okay, so it, you don't have to worry too much about the differentiation at this point. Chances are that what you've seen as the rate components of a mass balance were really um, you could do a differentiation in certain circumstances, maybe for a batch reactor or something like that. Um, however, my point is this K, the rate constant, um, is going into, or is essentially what 
this mu is. So the mu is our rate constant for this rate component of our reaction. And we, again, we can know that it's first order because we've got per time units here. Okay, so then to understand what this is saying, we have mu, this is our specific growth rate coefficient, so the rate constant that's defining specifically how quick the bacteria are growing in our current conditions. The current conditions are described by primarily by S. S is the amount of substrate available to the microbes, it's the food. And you see the S at the top, and you see the S down here. Um, essentially, this, the situation is mu is equal to the maximum mu that can ever exist when the microbes have as much food as they could ever possibly want, um, times the amount of food that they actually have, divided by the amount of food that they actually have plus some other value, which is effectively, we call it the half velocity constant. It's effectively the amount of food when they're halfway happy. They're halfway to the maximum amount of food that they could possibly consume, or the, the speed at which they could consume. So I will draw a graph on the next page to kind of explain that. Um, but typically, you'll have this parameter given and this parameter given and you just need to know something about your substrate, and then you solve for, given that, your specific growth rate. Is that a question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the food, when we talk about it in generic terms like just S, you can kind of assume it's, they have enough of the, mic, the, the smaller nutrients, and this is the carbon. Um, this is a carbon source. Is, you really don't need to differentiate it. You're right to be thinking about it in terms of which one is that, because if they were limited on one, that would play a part. We're not gonna go to that complexity, but yeah, this is the food, the, the stuff that they can grow on, and the stuff that's gonna cause an oxygen demand from the water. Bacteria will use this stuff and demand oxygen in return. And that's really what we're caring about. If we go back to our conventional flutes, the dissolved oxygen is critical to, to manage. Okay, so we've got this Monod equation. I'm just gonna draw a quick a graph here to show what I mean. Like if we take a look at how the specific growth rate changes as a function of how much food we give the bacteria. So we've got food and this is the growth, growth rate coefficient. Um, I'm just gonna say speed, <laughs> okay? Just to put it way simplified, it's the speed at which they're eating food in some sense, um, or the speed at which they're growing. So we might imagine that, you know, like ourselves, there's some maximum amount of food that you could possibly ever care to eat in a day or in an hour or whatever. And so the bacteria will eventually reach a new max that they'll, they'll never really go above that line. Okay. Maybe this is different from one type of bacteria to another, um, but they'll reach some max. And if they have no food, they're not really gonna be eating anything, not gonna be really growing. And so you can imagine this is gonna grow something like this, and eventually reach that asymptote where they're at their maximum um, specific uh, growth rate coefficient. Now, uh, all of this is really to kind of explain where this KS comes into the picture. You don't really have to know this or, or whatever. I just wanted to explain the concept for you. If we take a look at the distance between zero and the mu max, if we take half of that, so one half mu max, and we think to ourselves, okay, well, at what amount of food are they halfway? We could draw a line over, and then a line down, and then we find, okay, this is our KS value. It's a capital K, lowercase, a subscript S. We're gonna see a few different Ks um, by the notations that I'm using. I did, I did not take a look at your book, but I think most, most topics will use pretty much the same. I'm just gonna stick with this, so I'm not trying to 
change on you. I do apologize if this is different than what you've seen. Um, but I, I think I can do the best job just keeping it to, to these right um, this time. It should be similar, if not the same, uh, in your book. OK, so that's where the KS is coming from. They're halfway to the maximum um, happiness. It might, it might be more than double the food to get there, but in terms of how much food was required to get them to halfway to happy <laughs> or whatever, um, that's, that's the deal. OK, so this is really going to inform our kinetics of bacterial growth and then eventually decay. Um, so have you seen a graph like this so far? No? OK, so if we take a jar of water, put some nutrients in it, some substrate, some food, um, put some bacteria in there and add some oxygen, then what we can do is consider how fast bacteria are growing and how long are they going to grow until they reach a point where there's, they're kind of now competing for food, they're dying to the same amount as they're, they're growing, like they are reproducing, but other cells are dying, and they're kind of competing for the remaining food. And eventually there's really not much more food, and so mostly they're just dying. Um, even early on there will be some death, but there's just so many growing that that's counterbalancing in the, that growth phase. It takes a little while before the bacteria acclimate to the system, Bacteria are, in a sense, sensitive to the environment. They can be shocked by pH, by temperature, different things like that. Um, even if they survive, maybe they're not going to um, be happily reproducing right away. So if they went from a, a spot where they didn't have food, chunked them into the food, it might take an hour or two until they're starting to grow happily. So this might be something like two to four hours, and then the growth phase, you know, depending on the system, obviously, but maybe this is 18 to 24 hours, and that'll last for some amount of time. Point being, we have uh, the growth of the bacteria, and at the same time, we have a decrease in the amount of food in there. So we kind of have to track both, and this is actually the dynamic that we employ on purpose to treat wastewater. We want them to eat all that the junk that's in the water. So if you notice here, um, Kind of smaller letters we have dx dt so that's the microbes growing and in doing so they're consuming this food the substrate so we have uh, ds dt as a negative um, as a decay reaction okay kind of conceptually makes sense all right so let's get into how we'd actually put that into practice uh, with kind of mass balance approaches um, growth and decay. So our growth rate I mentioned was that's dx dt, um, or we can call it R of G, is that specific growth rate coefficient times x. Um, so it's mu x for for our growth rate. Um, we can elaborate and just go ahead and write out what mu is right here, and just put it in place. So that's x times mu max s divided by ks plus s. So that's our description of the growth component of, um, of the growth equation. I'm going to fix my uh, issue here real quick. Pardon me for just a moment. OK, sorry about that. All right, so our substrate utilization rate, are you guys just laughing about what I did, or? No, we're talking about the amount of equations. This is really different from what DJ was doing. So what, what can you tell me what? We what wrote the textbook. Huh? We, we wrote the textbook. You wrote the textbook. OK, so what, and what do you mean by that? Like you were just like we copying? Like we literally wrote the textbook like, during class. Yeah, we had the textbook pull up and we would write it, and then we would draft it. Oh, I see. So is this preferable, or is this just, yeah, just a, yeah. preferable? OK, good, good, good. Yeah, <laughs> What's that? More slides or more? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have, I guess I could post it to Moodle. Um, and I've got, what, as soon as I post one YouTube link, uh, I've been posting my lectures all there. So you could go back and kind of find basically all the lectures I've given for this class, for the other section um, of this class in last two years, since COVID, basically. So I, 
Uh, I did invest a little bit of time to learn just to get on the system um, and to live stream it and all that. And since doing so, I've, I adapted my slides and all that. But since then, I've, I've just all up there. So. Yeah, so I don't know how much my other content covers what he covered, um, but certainly you'll have easy access to the videos from my other class. And if you want, I'll go ahead and just copy paste all the lecture slides I've given for my other class here. Okay, so I'll do that. So basically, because I had loads of crap I had to do the class of this class. Yeah. So the material is basically the same, but the presentation is vastly different. So we talked about first order, second order. We did not go over that in this class. But like last okay. semester, we talked about how to come up with equations, how to work with these chemical equations. Right. We basically gave this a chemical equation to just show you how to use the chemical equations and how to solve the problems step okay. by step. So okay. a lot of the things that we presented last semester, we didn't present in this class for how to solve the equation problems and the, and the actual work problems. We yeah. did a lot of work with thinking how he did it and how he showed us how to do it. Okay. We come to the same conclusion, but it's right. a different teaching yeah. method. Right, okay. It's very different. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you guys for the feedback. And um, yeah, if if I need to be doing something different, uh, I really am glad that you're appreciating it. Um, but if there's something that something else that I need to do different, then we can talk about that. I would say normally I, when I teach the, the non eveg version of this class, I don't do the water softening because I don't care to torture all the civil engineers. Well, I kind of like torturing civil engineers with chemistry, but you know, I I don't I try not to too much. Um, so if you're going back through the, uh, the lectures, well, actually, I know you guys covered it. And so actually, that's fitting. I did cover it in my other class. So yeah, I'll, I'll just post what I did for this past semester. Um, you'll see slides like this. Um, you'll, have, you'll be able to scroll through the, uh, essentially, in my YouTube channel, it's a, um, if you go to the, um, what are they called? It's like a grouping of it's the EVEDGE 3110 lectures. Um, Essentially, that, that's what it'll be. I'll probably make a second um, category for you guys here specifically, um, just because for organization purposes. But you should have all of that um, if, if you'd like. I, I will say his exam looks a good bit different than the way I would uh, create mine. Um, I know just from my experience, I, I typically my questions have a bit of a range from easy to challenging. Um, sometimes I err on the side of challenging, but I, what I always do is give partial credit based on how much I see you've learned for the, the process. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to get you guys kind of up to speed with my expectations, but I also recognize without what we covered earlier in the class being kind of consistent, um, I may miss the mark if it's way too hard, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be lenient and I'll, I'll see that as I'm, as I'm creating. You also, based on the structure of the test he gives, um, you have the option to uh, not do some number of the questions or whatever, so skip mine if you need to, <laughs> right? Um, okay, so feel free to interrupt with more feedback. I'm gonna continue at this point, um, unless there's anything else. Okay, so substrate utilization rate. This is essentially, um, we need a way to understand how quickly the food is going to be taken away. That's that's our um, that's our design goal in a, in a way, right? To consume all the waste matter. So that's going to depend on how quickly the bacteria are growing, but also on how much food is required per mass of bacteria we produce. So that's the way we conceptualize it: is this yield coefficient, capital Y, is this mass of bacteria. mass of X, I guess, divided by the mass of substrate. So how many bacteria do we get per food uh, consumed? Uh, it should kind of make sense that's going to be required to make a relationship between how much food we're using versus how much um, bacteria we get. Um, there's another term here, lowercase k, which by the way is not the uppercase k, s, don't confuse that. Um, this lowercase k is the maximum specific substrate utilization rate coefficient. Sounds a lot like the mu, uh, but this is the substrate utilization. So when they are eating at the fastest and the happiest, how much 
um, substrate are they utilizing at that moment? That's, that's the deal. And so this is gonna be mass of bacteria divided by mass of substrate divided by time, okay? So milligrams VSS per milligram of VOD per time. Okay, so that will give us a way to compare um, the rate of substrate utilization to the rate of growth, which is part of the goal here is to correlate the growth to how much food is being used. So we can write the rate of substrate utilization is equal to, it's proportional to the growth, but in a negative manner, right? The growing bacteria, you're consuming the food. That's gonna be divided by that yield coefficient because there's some proportion of, well, you, you consume X amount of food, you get Y amount of bacteria, sort of thing. So that's then our, um, our deal. And by the way, I do, when I give my exams, uh, and I will have to modify your exam in this manner, I do give a periodic table. I give a lookup table for uh, dynamic viscosity, uh, density of water. I don't know if you'll need it for any questions that I'll add. Um, and I also give you some equations that would include things like this. So I will, I will post to Moodle um, essentially the equations that I plan to give you on the exam um, for the portion that I've added. Okay, so. Uh, so are we gonna make up our own? How did it work in the past? Did we you make up your own? Our own uh, equations. Okay, I'm gonna let you make up your own. I'm, we'll probably also post what I normally post for the class that I teach. That will include everything from the sections we have not covered myself with you and the stuff we have covered. So that's what I'll do. I'll just post that. That'll be simple and easy for me. And I'll provide the uh, periodic table and the lookup table for you. I'm just gonna give that to you on the, on the exam. You come with your own equation sheet um, is what I'll expect you to do, just as, as you have been doing. Okay, yeah. This one? This? Yeah. This is just units. Oh, yeah. So the, cool, these are just units for K. So that, sorry, that was just cut off from the rest of this line. Oh, yeah. So the, the units for K are milligrams VSS per milligram VOD per time. All right. Okay, so then we can, we know our, our growth, we define that as mu X. We now have our substrate utilization is minus the growth divided by y. And then the last component here is going to be the rate at which bacteria are dying. So that's going to be our d is just a death coefficient and the amount here. So our d is negative kd times x. So this is the rate component um, we can use to describe the rate at which bacteria will die in a, in a system. So this is a third K. We have K with no subscript, that's a lowercase K. That's the uh, one from a moment ago, the specific substrate utilization co rate coefficient. We have the KS, which is the uh, uppercase K. That's the half velocity constant thing. That's the amount of food where they're halfway to, to the happiest. And then we have this KD, which is the death or decay rate constant per time. So again, this is a first order, meaning it depends on, on the concentration of the stuff one time. We, if we had a two here, that would be a second order. If we had a zero, meaning it's not even there at all, it's just one. Um, if, if it looked like this, that would be what we call a zero order reaction. It changes by some amount, regardless of any conditions, every so often, every period of time. Okay, so our net growth rate then if we describe all of these things put together, well, really the, the growth and the decay is our prime of G, we can describe that as, well, the growth plus the death. Um, and of course, the death rate contains the negative in it, so it's really growth minus death, but the way to express it in this manner would be like that. Um, we can take it a step further, and instead of write it out as just the growth, we could actually describe it in terms of the substrate so that we can know how much substrate is being consumed. Um, so this R prime of G 
the net growth rate, that would be minus y times the rate of substrate utilization, and then plus the death term, which is negative kdx. Um, and what's happening there is we rearranged this term and then filled in for r of g, just put that in here. Okay, so this is a way where we can understand the growth and the death in terms of how much substrate and how much bacteria we've got. Um, of course, this is a now a system of equations. It's gonna be a little bit complicated. I have an example from the book that I normally teach out of um, for this process that we can go through. Um, that'll be right here. So we've got a table, first of all, that describes some common uh, parameters, some typical units that we might have. These are going to be things like the uh, that K, the maximum specific substrate utilization coefficient, um, the mu max, the KS, the Y, the KD. So all of that, we have kind of typical ranges. So typically you'll be, you'll be given those. Maybe that's the one unknown and you have to solve for it or something, but um, likely most of those, if not all of them, are given. We have typical units provided, a range that these units, these uh, values tend to be, and then default values here where these are specifically um, sp specifically what we can use for this example problem or perhaps some other example problems. Okay, so here we have a problem. It says we have a shallow pond. It stays well mixed due to the wind um, and a steady flow through it uh, from a creek. We have a few parameters drawn up there, but essentially, uh, before we finish looking at what the problem prompt says, we essentially see it's a pond. It's got some volume. We've got some amount of bacteria in it, some substrate. And the question, as we'll see, is really highlighting, okay, how much bacteria is leaving and how much substrate is leaving is, is kind of the question. And this will give us a chance to apply those uh, growth, death, substrate utilization rates um, to our system. We can imagine this as a CSTR, or you might have called it a CMFSDR. I don't know the phrase you learned, but did, you guys covered like the plug flow reactors, batch reactors? No? Okay. All right. Well, good for me to know. Um, so the way, the way I teach the class is I kind of start with an introduction of different reactor types, the generic forms. Um, if you had a mixed chamber that was just closed or not having any flow in it or out of it, that's a batch reactor. Um, if you have a kind of the same deal, it's mixed, but you do have flow coming in and a flow leaving, that would be what we call a CSTR or maybe a CMFR. Basically means continuously stirred reactor with flow going through it. And then you could have what I would call a plug flow reactor, EFR, where you have, uh, it's more like a pipe system where you have a long, narrow pipe, or perhaps you have some chamber system where it's like snaking through, something like that. This, uh, and then it, that's not mixed, except you can assume it's only mixed in infinitely small little slices that are flowing through it like a plug. Um, that changes the way mathematically we approach them, which I would have thought um, would be important for you to cover uh, to do some of the class. So we're going to use the CSTR for this problem, and I'll talk about that. I think it's not going to be too big a deal for me to kind of limit and uh, overview these these things as we go, but essentially this system looks like a CSTR, it's completely mixed, and there's water flowing in and out. That's going to affect how we build a mass balance equation um, to solve it. It would look very different if we assumed it was a plug flow reactor. Okay, so the problem continues and says, if the microbes in the pond uh, consume the inflowing biodegradable organic matter according to typical kinetics, that's referencing that table a moment ago, um, determine the following. A, the BOD leaving the pond. B, the bio 
degradable organic matter removal efficiency of the bond. Essentially, how efficient is it at removing the organic matter? And C, the concentration of volatile suspended solids, or X, that's leaving the pot. So this is X that we're looking at, S that we're looking at, and essentially the efficiency is really just going to be what we started with minus what we ended with, divided by what we started with, and we can put it in percentage. Okay, so that's kind of what we're looking for for A, B, and C. Um, and the solution starts us, we'll, we'll actually kind of work through it. I was planning to give you a moment to kind of think about it. Maybe I'll just, uh, I, I will give you a moment to think about it and see how you might try to approach it, but chances are um, I'm gonna need some feedback from you to see if you're at all familiar with this type of process. Okay, so the pond says, or so the solution says the pond can be modeled as a steady state CSTR because it's well mixed and we'll assume the stream flow is steady, has a steady flow and composition for a long period of time. So A says to set up the mass balance on the microbial mass using the pond as a control volume um, and the variables from that table. All right, so do me a favor and think about that if you have like if you had these variables on hand, which you kind of do, but, and then you were to go ahead into A and start solving from here, think for a moment, see what you would do, if you have any clue what to do. Um, just take a moment and then I'll ask you how you feel. Um, and if you feel like you might be able to solve it, go for it. How do you how do you feel about that? Not good, right? Yeah. Yes. Let me uh. Oh, sorry. Um, this part. Or. Yeah. Okay. So and that's that's really where you need to start is the equations we just talked about, right? Um, but in terms of like, are you familiar with working with mass balances? Some yes, some no. Um, from this class in particular, are you familiar? No, okay. All right. Um, not not expected. Uh, okay, so, you, and you know, I, I don't think that's entirely wrong. I, I think that you can focus maybe more on the technological side of things or the process side of things, but in order to do any sort of design with these types of systems, you need what we what we refer to as mass balances to, to describe, um, just have a quantitative way to describe 
how much is going to be removed or added or whatever it is um, over time, given the, the constraints you have. So um, that's, that's what we're going to see in this approach is we set up a mass balance to, and then we apply these rate components given the conditions of the system. And so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my time going through it and just do my best to kind of show the process. I, I feel bad because this is probably the most complicated mass balance I ever do with the class <laughs> right here. But it's after I've kind of prepped you, typically prepped my class, um, to deal with it. Because here we're dealing with actually two mass balances and it's not intuitive um, as to why. So try not to let this scare you into feeling like mass balances are the, the most intense thing ever. OK, so we're going to start um, with problem A. And essentially, what we're going to do is start where they mentioned a moment ago. So we've got, and in fact, what I'll do is I'll take a step back further from that. They mentioned do a mass balance on um, the on x. It is counterintuitive that we're trying to find s. We're doing this on x. Let's just put that aside. This is going to be the way we need to do it for this particular case. That's that counterintuitive part. A mass balance in general is going to be, we're going to take a look at the accumulation rate. We're going to set the accumulation rate in some volume equal to the input rate. And hopefully when we say this, it'll start connecting with maybe some of the things you've done and just didn't realize this is what you were doing. Uh, minus the output rate. So that would be the flow rate going in minus the flow rate going out, plus whatever reaction term you've got. So reaction rate. Now, you can have multiples of any of those pieces, right? But the overall mass balance is if you take that little lot circle there as what we might call a control volume, you're essentially looking at controlling whatever is coming in, whatever is going out, or whatever is reacting inside, whether that's a growth or a decay. So when we talk about a mass balance, really just defining a very specific area and characterizing everything about what happens to mass within that system, meaning what goes in, what's coming out, what's um, occurring inside it with a reaction. So when we do a mass balance on X here, first thing the problem mentioned is we assume it's at steady state. And what does that mean? That means we have no net accumulation. Now, things might be changing, but it's changing in a manner where the stuff is balanced. If you think about a checking account, you've got a certain amount of income, a certain amount of expenditures. Once you've reached steady state, the amount inside that checking account stays the same, even though you're spending and receiving money every month. Okay? The steady state is that over time, you come to a spot where on average it stays at whatever number. Right? It might be a high number, it might be a low number, and you might have a lot coming in or a lot leaving. You might have an interest rate generating a reaction inside, more money. But if you balance it all over time, you just have a, a steady amount that's the steady state. Now, if you are not at steady state, maybe you're accumulating in the positive direction, saving, or maybe you're accumulating in the negative direction, your um, supply is running lower. So that's what I mean by, that's what uh, the book is meaning by steady state. So that means that our accumulation rate is zero. So that's where this zero is coming from. So if, if this equation here was just way out of the blue, like where, why, where, how, that's where this is coming from, that steady state assumption. And then because it's a CSTR, I mentioned has a flow coming in and a flow going out. When we build a mass balance for a CSTR, we have flow components because that's the definition of the reactor. So this is going to be, we will have the input rate, which is going to be the flow rate times the concentration. We're doing a mass balance on x. So this is going to be times 
the initial x, the amount of x that's coming in. So really that's characterizing this flow rate, which is q, we have x naught and s naught. Since we're just focusing on x at the moment, that's this component of it. We, then we need to subtract the output, which would be q times x, right? This x final, or it's the same thing as the x right here, because whatever is in here, if it's completely mixed, is the same stuff that's going out, right? Draw that again. So this would be q, x. You could say final. I'm just going to leave it as x because we do know it's the same. Then we've got our rate. And so this is where we said plus um, in that volume, some reaction is happening. So in that volume, we've got r prime of g happening. That's the net growth and death. And so this should match what the book started us on. So q x naught minus q x, they kept the final there, plus v times r prime of g. Okay, That's coming from that mass balance concept. All right, so that's, that's where we start. I'm going to rewrite it and start simplifying over here. Um, wanted to kind of put that context over here. So the first thing you might notice is we don't have any bacteria coming into the system, at least no significant amount, x naught is zero. And that means we can simplify our um, equation a little bit. Uh, so we, can, uh, we say zero equals zero minus qx plus the v times r prime of g. Now, before we expand, like you guys were noticing, you need that equation. The equations here for r prime of g. Just to, you know, we've just talked about them, but we need them kind of in front of us to work with them. Before we even do that, one thing we can do to simplify a little further is divide everything by q. And if we do, that becomes, and you know what? I'll go ahead and put this the minus qx term on the other side. So we'll just say this is x. We divided it by q uh, equals instead of v. I'm going to use theta which is my term for the hydraulic residence time. So I would assume you guys have this equation down. Uh, the hydraulic residence time is V over Q. So the volume of a chamber divided by the flow rate. Um, maybe you called it something else or used a different symbol. Just, okay, so that's what I'm using there. Maybe it was tau or something for you. Um, so I'm saying that's going to be theta times r prime of g. Okay, so let's take a look back at the um, other equations there and say, oops, sorry. If we write a couple of these equations, let's see, we'll need first of all mu. Give me one moment, just so I can see this. Okay, so mu, of course, is going to be that uh, mu max times s divided by ks plus s. Also going to need sorry I'm trying to arrange I've got my solutions on one page and it's just not the most convenient right so we're going to need um, the essentially r prime of g is the r of g and the r of d so we'll just do it kind of manually so r of g is mu x our depth is going to be negative kdx. And then um, we could rearrange the r prime of g or the r of g into substrate utilization. And that 
may actually make sense to get our um, to find a way to solve for subscript because we're that's actually our goal for this mass balance. Okay. Um, in fact, actually, I don't think we need to. We'll do that on the next section. I'm sorry. Apologize. Okay, so I think we can just go from there. So we can say x is equal to theta times the mu x. I'm going to go ahead and write it out as x times mu max s over ks plus s minus, I'm um, sorry, that would be parentheses in the wrong spot. So mu times all of this minus the uh, k d x. And you'll notice this is all happening in some volume. We already accounted for that volume. And then it, that got transformed into the uh, hydraulic resonance time. OK, so from here, one thing you might notice is we have an x in every term. And that's pretty handy because we're, we don't know x and we're trying to solve for something else, right? So we kind of need that to happen. Most mass balances are going to be simpler. <laughs> so we don't need this type of stuff. Most of the time when we're doing a mass balance, it's not on two different systems, OK? Uh, so I apologize that this is a little intense for this one. So the x's we can cancel, divide everything by x. Those will just fall out of the solution. So we've got 1 equals theta times mu max s over ks plus s. What are we solving for in this case? We are solving for the BOD leaving the pond, which is s. And this will be minus uh, kd uh, theta. I just went ahead and distributed the theta across. All right, so that that leaves us with kind of a mess um, to find to solve for just s out of that. It's a bit of algebra, nothing more. Okay, it's just going to have to multiply the s's across and then expand and then consolidate the s's and solve for s. Okay, so I'll just take the first couple steps here and then I'll give you the kind of final equation there um, that we we derive. OK, so on the left, we could say 1 plus theta kd. Uh, and on the right, we have theta mu max s over ks plus s. We want to solve for s. Um, and so the next step, we multiply ks plus s to both sides and then get s on its own and then solve. Well, I'm going to save us a little bit of headache here. I did solve it earlier this morning or elaborate on it this morning. So if you wanted to go through that algebra, that material will be there um, online. But essentially, we get a, a final equation. That is s is equal to uppercase k s times 1 plus theta kd all that divided by theta mu max minus 1 minus theta kd Now this, um, this is an example of a mass balance where we derive something. And you might be tempted to go ahead and memorize this equation. But I would warn you that, well, <laughs> this is what I tell my other class anyway, when I teach the whole class. Maybe I would give you this on the equation sheet. And I'll, I'll go ahead and I think I have it on the equation sheet, so you'll see that. This is only for the case where we have a pond type system where we have a CSDR with no recycled line and with zero bacteria coming in the inflow. It's very specific to that case, right? The mass balance would develop differently 
this whole equation would develop, develop differently if any piece of that was different. Okay, so we will cover the recycle line um, type of stuff. It's actually a little simpler and not, not quite as mass balance oriented. Um, So that's, uh, that's the equation, and then if we put in the numbers, we have to get the numbers from, the, uh, from here for the specific values of k, mu max, ks, y, and kd. If we were to do that, then it turns out the substrate concentration um, was 6.9 milligrams mu d per liter. So that was the solution to part A. For that problem, yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you to bring your own equation sheet. I'm going to post to Moodle the equation sheet I normally would provide, but I'm not going to provide one. Okay, so you copy whatever you find useful from there. And the reason I'm doing that is because I haven't covered all those equations for you. So. Just take what you want, and I'm giving you that as a resource, like, hey, here's a few that I normally provide, so that you can take from there, you can build your own according to what you are expecting. All right, uh, part B here is fortunately pretty simple. You can use a kind of a generic way to calculate efficiency. That would give us 95 minus 6.9 divided by 95. Um, multiply that by 100. Since I did happen to solve this earlier today, I believe this is 92.7% or maybe it was 92.3%. Ninety two point seven, yeah. Yeah. For part A, where did you get the uh, stuff to plug in for that final equation? That was given. Um, so all the parameters for this, uh, everything but the theta was given. Um, so we had to solve for theta. Theta is V over Q, that's 200, 200 cubic meters divided by the 50 cubic meters per day. <laughs> Uh, that gives us four days. Um, so that would be one component. Everything else um, was called from this table here, these default values. Um, in, a, in a problem on an exam or a homework, I would give you those pieces just by themselves. Um, they, would, they would be in the problem. I would, I'd probably just give you the value. Okay, so time flies, and that's all we have time for. So I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Um, I'll be posting material to the course. I'll get a homework posted to you before the break um, so that you have the break if you want it. And that'll be due on the Thursday before our finals.